Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us. I'm Bob Burke from Natural Products Consulting. I'll be serving as host moderator today. Uh, you know, we're all living through uh, some strange and challenging times. In the midst of all the hurly burly, there's a ton of great content being pushed out from some wonderful organizations, uh, not the least of which being the Naturally Groups, who's hosting us today. Uh, Gary Hirschberg's tale uh, for the from the trenches, New Hope, uh, BevNet and Nosh, the Specialty Food Association, Elliot Began's newsletter, and others. We wanted to do our small part to share some critical info on financing options and, most importantly, how not to run out of cash. We're joined today by Gary Hirschberg, a longtime friend and colleague who is co founder and chief organic optimist of Stonyfield Organic and founder of the Hirschberg Entrepreneurship Institute. Uh, Andy Whitman, who is a career-long CPG operator who founded and leads 2X Consumer Products Growth Partners, the longest tenured investor in the emerging CPG brands, now Hi, referred to 20th anniversary. Keith Kohler is a debt financing expert who is advising his clients on all of today's debt financing options open to them, including the new SBA loans. He has significant experience in financing and advising companies in the natural product CPG and manufacturing industries. Jenny Chokran is a seasoned commercial lender and financing strategist with extensive experience in all types of SBA and conventional lending. Over the years, she's financed and advised hundreds of businesses in the CPG and food and beverage space. Nick McCoy and Mike Bergmeier are the co-founders and managing directors of um, Whipstitch Capital, the largest independent investment bank in the US, solely focused on the better for you consumer sector. The Whipstitch team has completed over 100 private placement and M&A transactions in the space of the last 12 years. And Elliot Began is the founder of TIG, a one-to-one -one customized alternative accelerator focused on emerging uh, natural product, helping emerging natural product brands grow. Sorry about that. TIG positions natural product brands to raise capital, prove their growth hypothesis, build community, and scale. Now, let me run through the agenda. We'll start with cash is king and, not how, and how not to run out of it, led by Gary and Andy. Uh, Keith and Jenny are going to do an overview of, uh, uh, oops, sorry, um, debt financing options with a specific review of SBA Disaster Assistance Loan and Paycheck Protection Program. Mike and Nick are going to cover the state of equity financing today. And Elliot is going to run through some best practices on being capital efficient and running on all cylinders when there's little margin for error. After that, we'll go into Q&A. And let me stop sharing here. Um, I'm just going to run through a few housekeeping items. Uh, you'll see at the bottom, there's a chat function for comments in your Zoom toolbar for comments and reflections. If you have any questions, you'll see the questions function at the bottom. Please keep it concise. Uh, tag a panelist if you'd like some input from a specific person. And we'll do our best to get to as many of these today, and then we'll post follow-ups on them later. Today's session's being recorded. We'll share the recording along with uh, session materials via email on the Naturally Bay Area website in the next 48 hours. And we'll also have contact info um, in the summary slides. But before we begin, I'd like to invite Don Buter of Davis Wright Tremaine and Chair of Naturally Bay Area to welcome everyone. Don. Thank you, Bob. Um, so my name is Don Buter. I'm a partner at Davis Wright Tremaine, which is a national law firm with a large food and beverage practice. Uh, I personally work with emerging brands in their food venture financing. Uh, I'm also board chair of Naturally Bay Area. We are the first regional affiliate of uh, Naturally Boulder. And there is now a natural, naturally network of six affiliates that's being expanded across the country. So we'd like to welcome all of those affiliates to this call today. And we're very fortunate to have thought leaders in our industry in us to navigate this issue on the panel today. So let me turn that back to Bob so we can get started. Okay, so uh, Andy and Gary, are you ready to uh, share your screens? Indeed. 
Uh, let's see, are you all seeing me, Bob? Yes, we are. Okay, good. Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us, and thanks to all my uh, colleagues here. Uh, this is Gary Hirschberg. In a moment, I'll uh, introduce Andy to uh, get us going. Um, look, Tash is king, uh, not to be sexist, it's king, queen, prince, pauper, it's everything right now. Uh, we are uh, in a unusual moment uh, here, obviously, but uh, in any moment, uh, but particularly in moments of crisis, uh, your number one obligation to yourself, to your shareholders, to your employees is uh, to not run out. And uh, at the Hirschberg Entrepreneurship Institute, which many of my colleagues today have been uh, contributing to for 20 years, we always begin with the cash, with how not to run out of cash session. And it gets very mechanical, as we will in a second. Because I find no matter what scale or size you are, uh, from startup pre-revenue to hundreds and hundreds of millions, uh, knowing and controlling your cash destiny is knowing and controlling your own destiny. Uh, and yesterday's uh, first of the uh, Tales from the Trenches uh, webinars that we're doing every Tuesday and Thursday, I began by uh, sharing some of my darkest hours in growing Stonyfield. And I can tell you, as I told that audience, that um, you know I, I learned this uh, critical importance of having your own cash flow tool, and again, we'll share one with you in a moment, uh, from uh, really the School of Hard Knocks. We got ourselves into a bit of quicksand uh, for a stretch of about five years in Stonyfield's early going, where I literally needed to do not a monthly cash flow, not a weekly, but a daily cash flow. And the spreadsheet that we will share with you in a couple of moments is a tool that I evolved uh, literally to keep me, keep my head above water and, and actually to enable me to sleep at night, which is another crucial strategy sure. for survival. We um, uh, literally would, I would know the next day what money was going out, whether it was payroll or vendors. And in those days, you can imagine I was on COD a heck of a lot of the time. And so therefore I knew from this tool what had to come in that day or we were sunk. And so uh, I'm sure it's obvious uh, to folks that uh, cash flow is crucial, but I want to underscore why we're spending as much time on this up front right now, which is um, this is, uh, we don't know how long this uh, stretch is going to go here. Uh, many of you have already learned, uh, and we'll talk about this during this webinar, to cut back on promotions right now. Many of you have learned to um, uh, take everything you got out of your line of credit. Many of you are employing these daily survival techniques. What I want you to know is none of us are alone here. This is something we've all got to do. We've got to do really well together. Uh, and we've got to basically be hunkered in for what could be a longer stretch than I think any of us uh, know and think. So with that intro, we're going to switch to Andy, um, uh, who will talk to you uh, generally about uh, sort of the classic errors when thinking about cash flow and opportunities. And then I'll come back and share this tool with you. Andy? Uh, you're on mute, Andy. Andy, you're still okay. muted. Thank you. Okay. Can you see the screen? We do. All right. Hi, this is Andy Whitman. Um, I am, as uh, Bob said, uh, a longtime operator in the CPG uh, business. So I've been through the trials and tribulations of things not going exactly according to plan. And for the last uh, almost 20 years have been an industry partner and investor in the space. Um, and as Gary talked about, you know, my very candid point of view is most businesses are not dumb ideas or idiots running them. The reason they fail is because they run out of cash. So P&Ls are really interesting and nice, but they don't pay the bills. It's all about cash, especially in today's world. So I'm going to do a very abbreviated drive-by. And again, these materials are available. So um, they'll be available for you quickly. What's the difference? So what I'm going to do is uh, just share, this is a business that many people would be interested in, in uh, owning. You know, you start in your first year uh, with a couple million, $3 million of revenue, grows to $14 million in the second year, you lose $163,000 in the first year, and you make three quarters of a million dollars. Interesting business. Many people would want to own that, right? 
No, don't look at it annually. So now if you look at the same business on a monthly basis, would that be a business you'd want to own? And a lot of people would say yes. And my point of view is p ls don't really matter. I mean, they're interesting and you, you need to have them, but at the end of the day, you can't cash a P&L. So what I'm gonna do is run through an exercise of converting revenue to cash. Um, and what Gary's then gonna do um, is walk through an exercise of how you build the cash from start up as opposed to convert your P&L. I think it's important for you to understand for the vast majority of folks that are only doing P&Ls, you know, how big of a difference it could be. So with that said, um, let me see if I can get something out of the way. There we go. All right. So if you have a business, again, we talked about this a little over $3 million. You know, unfortunately, none of us get what's on our price lists. Um, there's some cash discounts. There's some bad debts, unfortunately. Uh, there's an occasional return. And then there's those pe pesky trade discounts. So now you're, you know, a little less than half a million dollars lower than you thought. And of course, you don't get the money when you want it. You're going to get it 30 if you're lucky, 45, 60 days, 90 if you're selling to some um, drug customers. Um, so it's all shifted out. Now, again, you're going to get that money. But in the calendar year you were talking about, now you've only got $2 million or $1.9 million of cash. Again, if you think about your COGS, unfortunately, most of us, whether you own your own plant or use a co-packer, you can't produce um, you know, X percent of revenue in COGS. You need to do it in minimum order quantities. So your cash is a bit lumpy. Again, it's eating up a little bit more cash than you would if it was just P&L. Same when you start thinking about SG&A, selling general and administrative costs and again, I would encourage you to do this by employee. Um, you don't necessarily have to list the name, but um, by employee or by line items, there are very few of our small emerging brands that have more than you know, 10, 20, 50 employees, unless you have a plant or a DSD sales force. So um, you can do it as a group. I do it by employee. This example does not, but you know, you can't just have a percent of revenue. You're going to have some sales costs that are significantly in advance of your revenue. Your marketing dollars on your P&L in the top half of the page. You know, you've got the trade show booths. You've got marketing collateral. All that stuff comes in advance of your sales. And again, it's a little lumpier. The same on your rent, your insurance, whatever else. Um, those generally come earlier. And again, what you're seeing is not a massive difference. But, you know, a uh, 150-ish thousand dollar cash impact versus what your P&L in SG&A would show. So if you summarize, remember there was that first year where you lose 163,000. Um, if you were planning cash for 163,000, you're out of business in the early part of the year because um, this business sucked up $2 million of cash. Now, again, this was not an exercise to, to force in, you know, an oh shit scenario. This is just a little bit here, a little bit there, and all of a sudden um, it's real money. So remember, everything takes longer than you think and costs more than you think um, for what we're doing in today's world, brainstorm and plan and replan and re-replan. Um, in today's world, you know, most of us are doing cash on a weekly basis, and most of us are talking about it several times a week. And that's even in well-funded business. So that's a few highlights that are gonna transition into something, uh, a model that Gary is gonna talk to us about. So I'll transition back to you, Gary. All right, terrific, thanks, Andy. And by the way, we've left some time here for questions uh, at the end. Um, Andy, you seeing my uh, spreadsheet? Sure am. Okay. So look, uh, let me boil down uh, a couple of comments that Andy made uh, here by way of introducing this. Um, we entrepreneurs, by our very definition, anyone who's crazy enough to start a business is what I call a pathological optimist. And uh, you got to know that. And you got to look in the mirror and understand that, that uh, the difference between you and somebody who 
uh, might have had an idea but not started it, is that you're crazy. Uh, we're all crazy. And what that means is that we can be our own worst enemies. Uh, specific to Andy's point, um, you plug in revenues, you say, hey, I'm, I'm going to I'm not going to give, I'm going to say no to UNFI or, or, or Costco or Kroger, or whoever, I'm going to, and, and that's just simply wrong. Trade spend is probably the most uh, uncontrollable variable nowadays, uh, that gap between your list price and your actual price. Uh, I'm going to say, no, you must pay me within 10 days or 20 days. Well, again, as Andy said, that just doesn't happen. Good luck. Um, I'm going to be paying out. Uh, I'm going to stretch them. I'm going to go as long as I possibly can. Well, guess what? Uh, that uh, supplier of your ingredients or your packaging or certainly your labor, they're not going to wait around for you to do it on your schedule. So my first plea as I uh, explain this tool to you is uh, be conservative. Whatever you think the speed with which money is going to come in, have that time. Whatever you think the amount is, as Andy just demonstrated, reduce it, discount it. Whatever you think is going to go out, double what you think and, and speed it up. And then you have a fighting chance at living in the world of reality. Now, I mentioned earlier uh, that I had to develop the tool that is in front of you here, uh, what I call my indispensable uh, cash flow worksheet, except I see indispensable is misspelled. Um, uh, uh, but um, look, uh, I, div I developed this out of survival. And uh, so that you know what this is, it's downloadable at the hirschberginstitute.com. You can go on there and you'll see the webinars and you'll see this is available and you're welcome to get this after the webinar. But let me walk you through it. This is my version of a, a real-time tool. And as Andy said, and I just want to stress it again, um, do it, did I always have to produce a P&L on a balance sheet? Sure, my banks required it, my, my uh, board required it. Uh, uh, I required it, but the tool that I lived by, and again, I put across the top here the weekly, uh, this is done by week, but I had to live by this as a daily. So here's how it works. Let's just assume uh, for discussion purposes that you're starting this week with $100,000 cash in the bank. And this tool is all set up with cells that are already uh, pre-programmed, uh, uh, formula. And let's just say this week I have $10,000 of sales receipts coming in. So as you can see here, it automatically adds up. Now I might have royalty income, I might have other kinds of real-time operating income, but to keep it simple, I've booked and planned for $10,000 to come in. Now this particular week, I know I'm gonna have to send out 5K for ingredients, 2K for packaging, 5K for labor, 3,000 for insurance. And again, this auto totals to uh, $15,000 going out the door. And as you follow down the spreadsheet, that means I had a net operating flow, 10 in, 15 out of $5,000. Again, just trying to keep this super simple and you can do this on your own. Um, that leads you to uh, when you started with um, 100K, I, I'm sorry, that leads a net operating flow of minus five. And so this below tallies from your starting cash of 100, right here, this gets you to your uh, end cash of 95, which of course is, no surprise, the beginning cash that you will have next week. Now, this tool will let you play with, uh, play with variables. So let's just uh, say that we're for the next little bit here, we've had a little bit of a downturn where we're our, our food service customer, uh, of course cafeterias are out and retailers are uh, taking less. So let's just say we're having a little bit of a downturn and I'm just going to project for the next month 2000 bucks a week coming in. But as you saw here, I had already pre-programmed in my ingredients, my packaging. I should have, of course, put my labor, which uh, let's just say for uh, our purposes, it's a, it's a every other week, uh, 5,000. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, that'll continue for a month. And we'll just focus on the first month here. Uh, and uh, what you then start to see, if you follow the top line, is that with the money coming in, the 2K uh, coming in per week, and that's uh, to Andy's point, not what I'm selling, it's what's actually coming in. It's what's actually in my mailbox or in my, my uh, uh, account. So what you're seeing is that with the outflows here running along the way, um, 
uh, and the uh, inflow being modest, my cash is diminishing. Now, uh, where we get into trouble, and uh, let's just say, uh, let's just plug in, uh, uh, I'll just make it an et cetera, but let's just say uh, you had a legal bill that came because you did a stock offering or uh, whatever, uh, and you had a, a big hit here of 20K that uh, is coming on the third week of April. And let's just say that you had uh, a, I don't know, Andy, what a, uh, you, 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 you owe on, on, um, on a piece of equipment that uh, finally comes due. And let's just say for discussion purposes, that's a 50K hit. Well, note here that obviously your cash is plummeting. And what I really want you to, unders to underscore here uh, is that there will be a point out there into the, your future. And here it is May 18th, uh, low ebb, but just for discussion purposes, we're down to a thousand bucks in June. Well, you're sitting here at the end of March and you can see that coming. And what I wanna tell you back to my opening comment is because you are pathologically optimistic, I guarantee you, and Andy will back me on this from endless companies in his portfolio, I guarantee you that you're, you're gonna get to that thousand or go into the red probably around here. In other words, like uh, dieting, you know, you faked it, you've pretended, you fooled yourself. It's what we do, we're optimistic. You've said, oh, I'll find a way to stretch. Now, the problem in a few, minutes, we're going to speak, we're going to hear from some of our colleagues on the finance side. Um, the problem, of course, is it takes a while to get in capital, whether that's a bank line, uh, some equity, uh, you know, uh, your aunt uh, you go to, your friends. Um, and we all, I think, understand, but particularly in a dark time like right now, where there's a lot of insecurity, um, you need to double that amount of time as well. So what I wanna just uh, illustrate here is let's just say that I had to come up with 100,000 uh, in, uh, in May. Uh, that is, uh, well, this goes way into the red here. I'll just do a quick, uh, quick fix of that. Um, that is going to be a, um, a period that, uh, where, you know, as Andy said, you're in trouble. And you know where there we are in the hole. And of course, what is negative cash? Negative cash means you're closed. So what I want to say to you is, whatever that number is, whatever your circumstances, when you use a tool like this, and again, I, I offer you this tool, you're welcome to it. That whatever that number is, and here we're showing a hole of minus forty nine thousand. Uh, my experience tells me that you need a minimum of a hundred. You need a minimum of twice what your hole is. And the companies like Andy said that go under are not because they're not doing well on the top line. By the way, growth, steep growth or innovation burns a lot of cash. It can be for the right reasons, but you're out of cash. You can't make payroll. You can't pay your vendors. You're dead. So uh, that number there, the, when I say you've got to double it, um, you, you absolutely have to have that, have a plan for how you're gonna get that in. Or don't launch that innovation. Don't do that thing back here. Or sit down and renegotiate, you know, you can have, your trade partner can be one of your sources of financing. But the point is, is that don't fool yourself here. That number is real. Now recheck yourself, go back over, get a board of directors or advisors to, you know, we've got a lot of fantastic people who I turn to regularly. Elliot here, uh, who you'll hear at the end, Elliot and I are on the board of a little company that literally uses this now, she uses this as a uh, weekly tool. And we review it together every single week because in this now uh, crazy moment that we're in where she's gone from being mostly retail based to now being mostly e-com, uh, you can bet we need to be seeing out there eight, 10, 12 weeks ahead. And the final thing I'll say before turning it back to Andy is uh, an anecdote about this week. And again, Mike and, and, and Nick will talk to you guys about this shortly. Um, this is not a bad time to raise capital in my point of view, but you just need to double the amount of time it's going to take. This past week, we faced a situation in the organic space with a 
wonderful little company that had an opportunity to buy back. Their parent actually went uh, belly up. We had an opportunity to buy it back. And in one week, we were able to pull together 5 million bucks um, and take this company uh, back, which is uh, very exciting. Uh, but I got to tell you, to get to the seven people it took to get the 5 million, I had to talk to 15 people. Uh, and, and in these, this moment that you're in, if you're looking for bank debt, if you're looking for line of credit extension, if you're looking for a bridge capital, uh, you can bet it's going to take longer and you're going to need to talk to twice as many folks. So simply put, and in summary, uh, download this tool uh, again at the Entrepreneurship Institute, May 7th and 8th. We will spend time with real cases going through this. Play with it yourself um, or use your own tool, but whatever it is, uh, please don't fool yourself. This is not a time for illusion. Illusion uh, can really be a, a, a death experience. Andy, I'll stop sharing and go back to you. No problem. And the only thing I would add to Gary's spreadsheet is the only thing I can 100% guarantee with certainty is your projections are wrong. They're going to be better or they're worse, but because of the pathological optimist aspect, they're more likely to be overstated on revenue and understated on expenses. So with that said, um, I'm going to share my screen again. Hopefully this works again. Um, you see my screen? Yep. All right, great. So uh, at the very top of the screen, you can see the link uh, hirschberginstitute.com slash webinar hyphen series where you can download the spreadsheet. It'll also be included in the stuff you get from Naturally Bay Area as a result of having registered. I'm going to talk I, Andy, they posted it in the chat. So. All right, great. Um, so I, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, how uh, we've been approaching this with some of our partner companies. Um, and if there's a nugget in here, there'll be a whole bunch of stuff that I'm sure, uh, and I hope your reaction is, duh, okay. But for somebody, maybe not. Your nugget may be different than somebody else's nugget. So many people use the phrase, um, the goal here is to live to fight another day. I have a perspective that it's really about living to thrive another day. And with that said, I'm going to talk about what we're doing in our partner companies in working with our very talented partner company leaders. Um, so this is a um, uh, document that we put together for our internal purposes. Um, there's a link here on this page. You'd see it on the 2X Partners site. You can go there in the resources section. Again, you'll be able to click on this link when you get this presentation. So. Basically, all I did was take the document that's a very sort of convenient one pager and basically ripped it in thirds and you're seeing uh, a little bit on each page so that you can actually read it. Again, importantly, this was stuff we were working with with our partner companies and there's a million caveats. Some of this is obvious, some of it may not be. Things are moving rapidly. So even since this was put together in an updated 24 hours ago, there's some new news that I'll share, um, especially on the governmental front. And of course, you know, talk to your lawyers and accountants on a few things um, that may or may not be applicable. We are very knowledgeable on five geographies where we happen to have our partner companies. So we're very knowledgeable about the implications of um, stays of execution, if you want to call it that, on insurance policies and other things. But I only know those five geographies because we focused on those where our partner companies are. So a couple things. First, under the bucket of conserving cash. Um, uh, it's all about revenue. And think about, everybody's talking about the examples of can you make hand sanitizer? Sure, th that'd be nice if you happen to be in that business. But my favorite two new examples are, if you're familiar with Lisa, which is the um, bed in a box company that John Repigal, the former CEO of Seven Generation and Birch Bees is running. Um, John's an amazing leader and he had the vision saying, well, we're a non-essential business. How do we go from being non-essential to essential? And they're making bed in a box for these emergency hospitals. Not only is it doing a great thing for society, it's keeping his business afloat. Um, another one is my favorite local pizza restaurant is aggressively pushing out. They'll deliver you pizza uh, in a box kit. So you make it, it's dough, it's sauce, it's cheese, it's toppings. And for anybody that has young kids that are struggling for what to do with your kids, activities is key. And 
you know, making homemade pizza is a great activity. So alternate revenue source is a great way to do the opposite. It's a way to generate cash. Trade spending, for those of us that are doing OIs, um, retailers are for the most part not running trade events right now, not because they're, excuse me, not because they're trying to gouge consumers, but because they don't have the labor to execute them in store, shelf tags, changes, et cetera. So if they're not doing those at retail, make sure you're not doing OIs because they're not going to get passed along, at least in the short term, maybe through year end. Labor, everybody's talking about this. Uh, and if you're not, you should be. Doesn't mean you have to do it, but do you defer pay? Do you reduce pay? Do you do furloughs? Do you do layoffs? Again, things to think about, um, and there's no one right answer. Um, I will talk in a minute. Um, actually, I'll do it now. Um, the government program that Keith is going to talk about in a little while, there are a couple of them. One of them specifically is related to um, payroll. And I'll just show really quickly. Can you see the spreadsheet? Can somebody see that? Bob? Yep, looks good. All right. So th this is just a super crude one that says maybe if you're a 10 employee company, you could get $200,000 loan that almost all of it gets forgiven. That application process is going to start on Friday. Pay attention to it. Keith is going to provide some more examples. I'm glad to share this spreadsheet. But the point is there's sources out there to generate some cash. Um, OPEX, everything that we would normally think about as fixed is up for discussion. Rent, utilities, marketing spending, everything that would normally be viewed as fixed, everything is negotiable. And as uh, Gary is very famous for saying, if you don't ask, you don't get. Um, AR and AP, the only thing we should think about really hard is customers are paying slow um, and you probably should be too. Have those conversations. In our partner companies, we've created a receivables forum where all of our CFOs are talking about which customers are paying well, which ones are not, um, if they found a particularly helpful person. Anyway, share information with your peer set. Um, and on inventory, you know, everybody has tail SKUs. Think about, do you really need to produce the 10% of volume and below SKUs? If you're having trouble keeping pace with demand, focus where the fish where the fish are, for lack of a better phrase, use your cash wisely. Um, Andy, can I just, Andy, can I just interrupt? I, I, folks, I, I really want to underscore Andy's last point there. Um, this is not a time, you know, most of us live by the 80-20 rule. We make 80% of our cash or profits off of about 20% of our SKU assortment. Um, this is a time to be really, really tough on yourselves. Again, that pathological optimism shows up with oh my, you know, I must have that product out there or that this particular buyer likes it. Ask yourself, do you really have to produce it? Between reducing trade spend and using these other uh, uh, conserving cash techniques that Andy's talking about, a, a, a huge one can be skew reduction right now. I'm not saying take it out of your portfolio permanently, but believe me, your wholesalers and your distributors out there are having a really hard time moving stuff through their funnels anyways. So this is a great opportunity to take advantage of number seven. A lot of our cash gets tied up in inventory. So please take that one really seriously. Yeah, and um, normally if you have trouble fulfilling orders on SKUs, retailers will drop you, distributors will drop you. Nobody's focused on that right this minute because everybody's got that issue. So don't think this is the time to strive for 99% customer service levels on your tail SKUs. All right, moving on. Um, let's see, moving on, I hope. There we go. Extending your cash runway. For those of you that have lines of credit, I wouldn't say don't worry about your covenants, but this is the time to assume that they are flexible and have that conversations with your bank. Um, there are a number of people that are on this call that are going to have very traditional lines of credit with very stable banks. Um, and they're still drawing on their lines of credit just in case not that the banks will fail, but just because it may be less predictable on their own part. So having an extra buffer is a good idea. And there are people that are drawing with non-bank lenders just because 
they don't know the parties as well, they're a new relationship, any reason, this is not the time to worry about the couple of points of interest. Um, cash is important. Emergency loans, I won't spend much time here. Keith will talk about this uh, at length. Um, but don't forget about state programs and city programs. We've got two partner companies in New York City and there are half a dozen state and local programs in almost every jurisdiction has things like that. There's also what I would consider free money. I referenced the Facebook one here, but there's a Google one, there's others. Essentially, Facebook is giving $100,000 per company or up to $100,000 per company, either as a grant, think about that as truly free money with no strings, or free advertising. In either case, as of yesterday, they weren't actually accepting forms, but there's a place where you can go to their website um, and sign up for a notification when they're ready. The same with Google. And insurance policies, many states, the insurance commissioner has dictated a waiver on insurance. That's a very small minority of states, but um, pay attention. Your policies probably have an exception for pandemics, meaning you can't claim business interruption, but that is not the case everywhere. For those of us in the Midwest or Saturday Night Live fans, you would know the cheeseburger, cheeseburger uh, skit. Um, the Billy Goat restaurant here has very publicly sued their insurer because the insurer denied a claim on business interruption when they do not have a pandemic exception in their policy. So with that said, these were the three pages of summaries. Uh, it was really a one pager. The one pager is downloadable. If I leave you with one final thought on this, Remember, every dollar that goes out the door today is not available next week to weather your storm. So this is not the time to pontificate. Be decisive, conserve cash, because you may need it. You may need it badly. Yeah, so with that said, uh, Gary and I can take questions specifically if it's related to the model, if they're more gen general questions, um, we'd be glad to uh, handle that when we have a, a broader um, uh, time slot. Yes, yeah, so uh, Andy, we do have a couple of questions that have come in. Uh, Bert Cohen's asking any suggestions on how to deal with distributors that refuse to allow changes to their to the already in place 2020 OI off invoice uh, uh, calendars, i.e. removal of promotions. Uh, I have a very simple answer from my portfolio of companies, which is you gotta, you gotta over communicate right now. You've simply got to talk to them. It, it may be latent, it may be somebody not paying attention. You may be too small a fish for them to uh, be uh, uh, watching. Uh, Corinne Schindler, uh, until recently the CEO of Infra just uh, texted in that um, UNFI right now is taking 3,500 items off of their offering uh, sheet right this second. Uh, I mean, the distributors are, uh, really, really busting just to keep product going. Uh, I don't, I'm here in Northern California. My stores um, uh, will, uh, you know, they'll have a senior hour at, uh, at 9 to 10 a.m. Uh, for us old folks to walk the aisles. And then at 10, the store opens and the center of the store is getting wiped out by 11, 11, 30, 12. Um, so absolutely don't feel, you should not be bound uh, by deals that you made a month or two, let alone six months ago, you've got to just speak directly to them. And it's the old don't ask, don't get. Other questions? Bob, are you seeing any? Let's see, if you looked at the uh, Q&A, somebody asked about, um, are you worried and thinking about the cost of cash, i.e. interest rates, or does that really matter if it's a matter of survival of the business? Well, I think the answer to that is uh, pretty straightforward on the last sentence, but let me give a, a, a more um, nuanced answer. Of course, you know, you want to you wanna live to thrive another day, and if that means a little bit of interest tomorrow for the hamburger today, that's a good thing, as <laughs> Wimpy would say. Um, but um, I think importantly, um, a number of our lines, um, banks have given a four-week almost barely had to ask um, waiver on any payments. Again, if you don't ask, you don't get. People are being remarkably flexible for a short window, take advantage of it. Um, and you know, if you ask for something reasonable, you might get it. Um, 
likewise, um, Nancy asked about um, factors. Factors. Um, there are some great factoring options that are fine. There's also C2FO, uh, C2FO uh, letter C as in Charlie, number two, F as in Frank, O as in Oscar, C2FO.com. Um, and uh, not every retailer participates in it, but Kroger and Hy-Vee and, and Giant Eagle and a bunch of others do. Um, again, it's a way that you know, retailers essentially accept an offer you give them. So instead of 210 net 30, you might regularly average eight tenths of a point and get your receivable sooner. It doesn't work for receivables that are overdue. It works for new invoices. Uh, but again, there's a million ways to skin this receivables cat, but that's one of my favorites. So another question is, uh, we've been told by numerous people to cut our broker and sales organizations during this time. We love our partners, don't want to jump the gun and burn bridges. What are your thoughts? Uh, I, I agree. Uh, this is not the time to burn bridges. Um, this is a human crisis uh, uh, that is touching everybody, right? And does that mean that you, uh, it's business as usual? No, it may mean uh, that you talk again, over communicate, talk with your broker partners about streamlining. It might be um, uh, you have to sit down and uh, have a call this afternoon about a different allocation of time, uh, some particular accounts that need some handholding. Uh, uh, it may be, uh, yesterday there was a great suggestion of, about uh, virtual demos. Uh, maybe something like that could be set up. Maybe some of the retail staff out there, could, this is an opportunity to give them some training or even your broker some training. Um, you know, I, I, I obviously, uh, you know, to keep afloat, you've got to throw some ballast off. But, uh, but it, the, in my experience, having weathered many, many crises, um, it's people who get us through and, 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 and people should be one of the last things that you're, you're, you're cutting or releasing. I and you'll hear uh, from Keith, you know, the, the payroll example that I gave, um, if you do have some uh, layoffs, if you do have some furloughs, or if you do have some across the board pay reduction, which the latter of which is fairly common, um, and everybody understands it, um, again, it's still hard because these are people, um, but you know, it may be the right thing to do. Every business will make a different decision, but as long as it's less than 25% of your total average monthly prior year payroll, it does not affect the ability to be uh, loan forgiven. Yeah, so I'm gonna hit two quick questions and these may be the end, Andy, and maybe you wanna yeah. add uh, that are here. Um, Lauren and an anonymous attendee were ba basically asking about raising funds. Mike and uh, Nick will talk about this in a little bit, but this is a particular question about the angel investor environment. And again, I've had these very current experiences of, of, of recently as uh, in the last 24 hours. Uh, look, this is what I wanna say is that um, every angel is going to be in a different uh, condition. I had some who are flush with cash right now and don't know what to do with it. And, and you should not assume that everybody's uh, cash uh, uh, tight. As a matter of fact, uh, you know, there's books written about m fortunes made at, at downturns. But uh, indeed, out of the uh, 15 angels I spoke to to do this ultimately seven person deal, um, half of them, good mm -hmm. entrepreneurs, normally aggressive, they said, no, thanks, we're gonna, we're gonna hold our powder right now. But the other half were ready to go. And I, I've um, now, um, in, the la in this last week, been engaged in uh, four different deals, raising money from angels. So, uh, but the question asked in there, uh, you know, should we possibly scale down? Yes, you should put possibly scale down. Uh, this is a, a bit of a triaging time. And if there's nothing else that you take from Andy's and my time with you here as we go into the other uh, presenters, um, it's that you, you know, use a cash flow tool like the one we just shared with you or your own. Uh, be disciplined, make it your daily guide. It's, it's, it's a, you know, business plans are usually irrelevant by the time they're written. This is not an irrelevant exercise, it's a real time exercise. And if you uh, thought that you needed 100K or 500K or a million, uh, find a way to make it uh, half that and, uh, and it's, it's, uh, it's, um, it's probably gonna be to your betterment. Uh, let me just close uh, by saying, as I mentioned earlier about the Institute, we're May 7th and 8th 
Um, uh, if you ha are raising capital, we will have 30 investors uh, who will be available that day. You can submit a pitch. Uh, these are ranging from angels to institutions. Uh, Mike, Bob, Elliot, Andy uh, will all be part of this program along with some other amazing uh, um, uh, presenters. Uh, if you don't even know how to shape a financing at this time, whether it's a debt deal or an equity deal or an angel deal or a bridge deal or a trade deal, uh, we have case uh, opportunities for you to submit cases. If you're even wondering just about what, uh, how your brand should be positioned in these changing times, again, we have those cases. So go to hershberginstitute.org. It's a 501c3 nonprofit. We're here just for your benefit. And uh, uh, Andy, thank you for taking the time. And Bob, I think we'll flip it uh, back to you. Perfect. And I just want to, uh, before we go on to Keith and Jenny, I just want to kindly ask the audience, um, we have a couple of streams of questions coming in. Some are coming in through chat, some are coming in through Q&A. If you have something arch or snarky to say about something Andy said, keep that in the chats. And if you have a question, uh, we'll be closely monitoring the uh, question uh, facility here. So uh, Keith, if you'd like to share. Okay, everyone can see my screen. Yeah, you want to maximize? Yep, there we are, right? Or a slideshow? Yeah, perfect. Okay, Thank hey, you. welcome everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here with you and my colleague Jenny Chakran, who's joining me here. Uh, Jenny and I are debt financing experts. We've worked extensively with a lot of the companies in the natural and organic space, and that's really where I cut my teeth and got my start in financing. So I'm very grateful to be here, to be asked to be of service to you and our objective is to provide as much information as we can. This is a very fluid situation, They're literally changing by the moment. So uh, in fact, a couple of times when I've had to go off of here and stop my video, it's to check in with my SBA contact to see if anything's changed before we go live. And indeed things are still changing and Jenny and I can talk to you about that. So we're gonna go right through the slides, I think. <laughs> and um, we'll start off by saying, you know, I'm Keith Kohler, the president of K2 Financing. And, Here's my background, how you can connect with me on LinkedIn. And I've set up a special email for this purpose assessment here. And just a bit more of my background, um, working with Ber Bergmeier on the debt financing presentations at their um, seminars. I'm a part of Nutrition Capital Network and I have a couple of other involvements there. Jenny, who will be joining me, uh, is joining me here on this presentation. This is her background. Please connect with her on LinkedIn and her email. She's an awesome commercial lender. I've worked with her on probably some of my toughest deals and she fights really hard to get the deals done that are meaningful to her. And then um, we can just go right in and talk to you a bit about today's lending landscape. We just wanna set the scene for you so that you have some more perspective and insights based on what we're seeing, based on our experience, based on what we're hearing from our network, our talks with our SBA colleagues, our talks with other bankers and our broader banking networks. So you know, many lenders have stopped lending. They put moratoriums, not just on conventional lending, sometimes SBA. A lot of them are not taking new applications, uh, but the SBA programs are still in place. The traditional ones are still there. So if you qualify them for them, don't stop, keep going there. Um, Non-bank lenders are still in play. And we really strongly uh, tell you if you're an essential industry, if you're still going and if you're still growing, which is certainly many of your cases because you've seen explosions of your online business, uh, or even your, your standard wholesale and retail business as a result of this crisis. Um, but those abruptly shut down or severely disrupted, that's what these programs are made for, the new programs. And we're gonna take you through that right now, okay? One a couple of other uh, things to set the stage. What we really suggest you do now is you take a look at what you're gonna be a year from now, kind of building on what Gary and Andy have said, you really need to put your planning horizon forward for a year and think about what this is going to, what this crisis and what this business interruption is going to mean for you. We must tell you, you have to have to have to have your financials updated. 2019 year end financials for us are the four listed here and strongly encourage you to have your interim financial statements done through March. It's April 1st. That's really quick. Most of you get that done by the 10th or the 15th, but please do all you can to have those updated. And the reason for that is a very specific one. March is when almost all of you would have started your definition of economic injury, okay? I'm using our favorite little um, 
uh, quote signs because that's an undefined term and something you have to define for yourself and you have to argue for in your applications no matter which route you go. If 19 is file, uh, tax return is not filed, that's probably at least half of you. 18 tax return is your more relevant tax return for the purposes of underwriting. We'll go into that. We wanna make sure you have your K1s and W2s ready. Be current on all your taxes. You can't have any liens and apply for these programs. You have to be squeaky clean. And like we're suggesting, you went, we want you to keep a detailed record of what you were calling your economic injury. Keep a separate file folder for that. Start recording what that means to you because it can be a very unique definition, okay? And for most of you, again, even go back farther in 2020 than March, maybe it's middle February, maybe it's earlier. And if we can be so emphatic, in addition to what you do now, here's some more critical things which you can do right now. If you are pursuing SBA lending or any conventional lending, get it done now. Uh, it's important to show your strongest uh, case. And if you were profitable last year and you're profitable this year before the crisis, that's your strong case. As you move through it, if you're going to experience issues, you want to be able to show your best historical ability to pay the loan and your best historical credit worthiness. Check your business credit score. Try to keep your personal credit score at a level we're calling bankable, which is traditionally 680. If there are issues, work on them now, address them, and you have to explain them in any type of application. Know where you are in relation to your investors, your bankers, your suppliers. Again, the others have mentioned this in the call. I encourage you very much to know where that is and how, because our planning horizon, you'll see at the bottom, is 12 months forward. So you have to have a good idea about who's gonna be there for you when you need them. Who can, where can you call in your favors? Can you get extended payment terms? Will you get discounts if you pay early? All of those issues are in play as you do your planning going forward. And again, this is a part of the broader discussion about demonstrating economic injury, okay? So SBA traditional loans are still available. Those are the ones many of you know, perhaps many of you have seven A's or you've applied for them. Some of you have credit lines, Express, et cetera. As many of you have seen, the SBA will make six months of payments. So Jenny and I strongly encourage you to reach out to your bankers and your loan service uh, areas of your bank if you have current lending to talk about how that can work for you. Uh, remember the SBA is a guarantor on traditional bank uh, uh, SBA lending. The banks are the ones that establish the credit criteria. And importantly, the credit box is shrinking. The hospitality industry is uh, not being lended, lent to in as an aggressive fashion as it was before and really the strong deals are getting done. So the conclusion of all of this is you've got to get really a banker and commercial lender and be in constant communication with them. So this chart is a good illustration of how dynamic and crazy things are. It may not even be current right now. And literally up to 2.30 before we started this webinar, I was redoing this chart, trying to give you the most up-to-date information. And I might still be wrong but our commitment to you, Jenny and mine, is to get an updated chart to you with this summary as soon as we can, reflecting the day-to-day -day changes. The yellow shaded areas were just recently changed. You know, Jenny can tell you the 2.25 was 2.5 until what, Jenny, about an hour and a half ago? About that, yeah. And, and yeah. now it might be back to 2.5. They're, they're okay, going so back there you go. So just since then. Yeah, it's totally crazy. And Jenny's gonna take you through PPP in detail because she's the real expert on that. I'll take you through EIDL in more detail. I've been more familiar and in touch with my SBA contacts about that. So we'll come back to this chart and we'll send that to you when it's updated in full, okay? So, um, so just some more important insights before Jenny goes in. You can apply to all programs. Some of you have been told you can do only one or the other. It's just about how you use the proceeds. Okay. If you use PPP for payroll, you can't use EIDL for payroll. Pretty straightforward. This is about paying expenses and retaining jobs. This is not for growth and expansion. If you're growing and expanding, and I hope that's you, use the regular traditional SBA programs for that. Those what the, that's what those are made for. Your credit worthiness is still a factor. Ability to pay back is still critical. There's lots of ways to do that. The best way is historical debt service coverage defined as your historicality. But if you have, if you've lost money in the past, but you know you're going to be making money in the future, if 2020 was going to be profitable for you, that shouldn't take you away from applying for these loans. And that's the case that you can build. Okay. Uh, the EIDL is done by the SBA. You work directly with them. The banks themselves are administering the PPP. You work principally with the bank where you have your deposits. If they're not working with you effectively, you can certainly work with other bankers who are accepting new customers at this time. That's not everyone. So typically start with your deposit bank, see what their attitude is, go from there. 
Uh, the applications start Friday, April 3rd. You probably have all seen that and received notifications from your bank. The exception it's April 10th for contractors and self-employed. Jenny is definitely suggesting get in touch with your banker now to show your interest in applying and collect your materials. And um, just a quick summary, terse summary to think about this. This is like applying to your top choice college. So get it all right, document it, have everything accurate, substantiate everything. I can't stress enough the importance of accuracy and completeness. So I'm going to turn this over to Jenny, but just say this is the one site, and I'm sorry it's not a, a bit.ly link, but you can cop copy and paste that in your, in your browser. That's the link from the Treasury Department that shows you what is the summary for borrowers. And that's a great one-stop shop for all the latest information about how the program works. But now I'm going to turn it over to Jenny to go through the details of the payroll protection plan. Okay, actually, Keith, go back one to the other slide, to the link. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, go up one slide. There you go. All right, so that everybody knows, there is a shortcut to that slide. It's uh, treasury.gov slash CARES. C A R E S. Um, that is that will take you to that the same place that that link that Keith is showing you will take you to. So it's okay. uh, treasury.gov/cares, uh, and in there you will find the uh, a lot of information. Most importantly, the current application as it stands, as well as an overview of the Paycheck Protection Program and overview of other programs that are part of the bill that are less publicly televised on the media, but actually fantastic sources to different uh, businesses of different sizes. And I highly recommend uh, utilizing that form. Um, the application itself, uh, like I said, is there, but there's also a uh, more in-depth borrower information sheet in addition to the overview. And then the ironic thing that's in there is the lender information sheet, which kind of tells you how are the lenders underwriting these loans. So you can go ahead back down one slide. Mm -hmm. Um, so the final application in theory is not out. And I am saying that because there is an application on that website. The first time we had the application, we were on version one, then we were on version two, then we were on version three, and all that happened within a few hours. So I would suggest waiting until Thursday sometime before you download the final application because my suspicion is it will change one more time. Um, so starting with that, uh, Keith earlier alluded to that if you have existing loans, you should request a deferment. I'll add to that that you should think about what kind of deferment you're looking for. Tying it back to the cash flow conversations discussed earlier by the team, are you looking for interest uh, deferment? Are you looking for principal deferment? Are you looking for principal and interest and why? And understand the why behind that because what you do in your deferment requests will impact your ability to borrow tomorrow and the next day if this doesn't last as long as some are projecting. If it does last as long as it's projecting, you might be able to say, you know, for right now, I only need principal deferment. And then later on, you can say, okay, I'd like to add interest to it. So don't be so quick to jump the gun on both unless you really need it or unless your business is really gonna be significantly uh, benefit from doing that. Now, if you just started your business in 2020, you still qualify for this program, you will have to take your average uh, salary numbers from January and February and utilize that the same way that the rest of this presentation is gonna talk about. So um, on this page, we're really talking about what is considered payroll costs. In the actual uh, bill, there is one definition of payroll costs. You can find it under section um, it's one of the first sections, so subtitle A, and then it goes into um, section 2109, item 8. And it says the term payroll cost. And I'm going to read you from the statute itself. The reason I'm doing that is because the guidance that we've gotten from the Treasury and from the SBA and on the application and on the lender application are all completely different. So here's what the statute says. It says the sum of payments of any compensation with respect to Employees, that is a salary, wage commission or similar compensation, payment of cash tip or equivalent, payment for vacation, parental, family, medical, or sick leave, allowance for dismissal or separation, payment required for the provisions of group health care benefits, including insurance premium, payment of any retirement benefit or payment of state or local tax, 
assessed on the compensation of employees, the sum of payments of any compensation to or income of a sole proprietor, independent contractor that is a um, wage earner, a commission income net earnings from self-employment, similar compensation, and that is in the amount of not more than 100000 in a one-year period or prorated covered period. So that's a lot of legal mumbo jumbo, but that's why this slide exists. So that's what the actual text says, and that's where the $100,000 a year maximum comes from. On the, and the reason that that's important, what, what I just read, is because that's the, that's the bill. What happens with these programs, like with every single SBA program, is that the text is written and it's left up for interpretation and then SBA has to give the banks guidance on how are we interpreting that language? So how are we interpreting salary? How are we interpreting commissions? How are we interpreting time off? And a lot of times that interpretation comes in something you don't ever see. It's actually on the lender side and it's the lender certification that they've met the requirement that you, the borrower, meet these criteria and have and can validate this criteria. So, um, so that's really what's being discussed here. What documents are going to be required, right? So that's a lot of information. How do you prove this? And the answer to that is it depends on who your bank is. Every bank is going to look at that differently and they're going to have to attest that they're comfortable with the information that you presented. So if you've not already done so, contact your primary bank. You're going to ask them two questions. The questions are, number one, are you an SBA preferred lender? The reason you want to ask that question because that tells you whether or not they can take applications on April 3rd. If they're not a preferred lender, April 3rd may not be their start date. Number two, do you know um, if the bank is actually going to offer the uh, paycheck protection plan? And the reason you want to ask that is because not all SBA lenders are opting into this plan. There are some risks to the banks, and not everyone is 100% certain if they're going to actually be promoting and, and utilizing this program. The other problem with the plan is that the banks are anticipating tremendous volume and for a very short period of time. So the requirement to hire a lot of people in order to manage and support the volume and meet their client expectations might be too big for them to do in the time frame that they have available to them. So there, there's some, some issues around that, and, and banks are really trying to struggle with who is and is not going to be working through. Um, and then uh, if the bank is going to do it, and they so they are a preferred lender or they plan on offering the program, then the next thing you need to do is say, I am interested in this program. If you've not already done that with your bank, I highly suggest that between now and tomorrow afternoon, you make that phone call and you let them know that you have an interest because there's going to be a list of people that have an interest. If they are not going to be participating, it's time for you to look for a lender that is, and that's going to be a lot more complicated to do. So um, let's go ahead and go to two slides down, I think, to additional required documents. All right. So at the very least, my guess is that a lot of banks are going to require these types of documents. They are going to ask you how many employees do you have. They're going to try to understand based on the application what your uh, payroll costs were and how it's broken down. I was just looking at the lender application that was released just a few hours ago, and they broke it down like the payroll costs, costs related to the continuation of group health care benefits during the periods of paid sick, medical, or family leave, employee salaries, commissions, or similar compensation. And here they wrote capped and annualized rate of 100000 then they have uh, mortgage interest payment, rent, utilities, interest on debts incurred before February 15th, and refinance eligible economic injury disaster loans. So they've broken it down into those categories where they, bank, they want the banks to identify each number individually. So in terms of the documentation you're going to supply, my guess is these are the categories that the bank is going to need broken down. Um, one of the things not everyone is talking about up front and not everybody has in place, their operating agreements and bylaws, that's really important because as a business, the only way the bank can validate that you are actually allowed and permitted to sign these documents on behalf of your business is through your operating agreements and bylaws. And the reason that I bring this up is a lot of times people don't have those. If you have them, Pull them up, have them ready to go, and send to your bank. If you don't have them, I highly suggest creating them. 
there is going to be such a list of businesses that are requesting this information and requesting these applications, you will simply wait in the queue if you don't have this. And this is really important. Get your documents in order. Have what you need to have in order to go quickly through the system. The last thing is I would pull 12 months of your bank statements. In those bank statements, you have proof of payment for ACH, for direct deposit, and so forth. I heard today that ADP it has a report that um, it can be used for the CARES Act, it's like a CARES Act report that you can pull down from ADP that will give you some of your uh, headcount and payroll information in a, in a drop down. Now, the, the one that I saw from one of the clients that I have uh, didn't give all the information broken down. So I think they're contacting ADP to find out some more and I've sent it up to the bank to find out some more information as well. But supposedly ADP is trying to help those clients that uh, do use them for, for payroll. The application itself, and I will show you what it looks like. Um, hang on, I have lots of versions of it. Um, but this is the application. It's a three piece, it's actually a several pieces, of, uh, four pieces of paper. And the four pieces of paper have a signature on page two, all right? Page one and page two have to be completed by every single 20% owner. So if you have three owners, you need three pieces of this application to be submitted to the bank. That's very important. The other thing is, a lot of times we tend to, I'm guilty too, we tend to skip the fine print. Well, guess what? On page three of the fine print, very much at the top, it tells you instructions for completing this form. And one of the things it tells you is how to calculate the monthly payroll. And something new that's different from what was actually in the bill is it says that for most applicants, we will use the average monthly payroll for 2019, which is different than what the bill said. The bill said for the 12 month historical period prior to the application, which would indicate, let's say, March to March. That's not what this is saying. This is saying for the calendar year. There are provisions in there for seasonal businesses, and there are provisions in there, like I said, in the very beginning for those businesses that started in 2020. But the point is, read the fine print on this document because this is a completely different world. The other thing is, I'm going to tell you, be very careful not to accidentally commit fraud. All right? And what I mean by that is, if you don't read this, you're not going to realize that accidentally committing fraud can put you in jail and give you a huge fine. So make sure you understand what's being asked for. If you're doing something and it's the best guess and you're really making an effort and it's not fraud, then, and you can back into it with your documentation, you're fine. You don't have to worry about it. But you got to be organized. You got to keep your documents like Keith said before. Um, and you have to be very, very, very careful with that. So uh, Keith, if you want to go to the next slide. Mm -hmm. All right. Documentation for loan forgiveness. So here is Jenny's tip of the day on loan forgiveness. Create a separate checking account for loan forgiveness. And the funds that you are going to use, that you're going to try to get forgiven, you only process through that account. Okay, that's my tip. And here's the thing. I know it's a pain in the neck to change ACH on payroll. I get it. But it's going to be a bigger pain in the neck if you didn't get forgiven for something you should have because you didn't document it well. So what can be used for forgiveness? Well, the very last information we got, again, this is different. It's very fluid, and it can change again. So I don't know what it's going to finally look like. But the last thing that we got said that only 25% of the amount of money you receive can be used for non-payroll related expenses. And that's a very important change to what was originally told to us. So if that's what becomes final, again, we don't know, a lot of this is speculative, but if that is in fact what becomes final, then what you wanna do is you wanna make sure that let's say you were given $100,000, right? Then you make sure that no more than $25,000 of that is being used for non-payroll related expenses. That non-payroll related is going to be what I was telling you before, which is the mortgage interest payment, rent, utilities, interest on debt incurred, and refinancing eligible uh, uh, economic injury disaster loans. So that, that number is going to be limited to 25% of the total money. The other 75% should be used on payroll. And so the, the other thing about the loan forgiveness is it's probably the least 
detailed part of the program today, which is another reason why I think you should use a dedicated uh, checking account to manage those funds. Because as we get more information, you're going to get the information, we being the banks and the lenders and the SBA uh, representative. Um, so as that information comes out, but if it's all in the same bank account and you're careful about how you use it and you're waiting for the guidance on how you can use it in order to do it, payroll we know is good. That's the purpose of the program, right? Um, but as long as you're doing that, you should be fine. Um, r remember, the, the Paycheck Protection Program is not a gift. It's not free money. It's Think of it as an economic jumper cable, right? The goal of this program is to save jobs. So why forgiveness? Why are they calling it forgiveness? And the answer is because the federal emergency resources that were tapped into here were specifically tapped in to preserve the American economy, right? They could have given out more money one time like they're doing on the consumer top side, or by creating this model, they're facilitating economic life support, if you will, that is self-sustaining. Um, and for your part in participating in this economic life support, you get the benefit um, for your partnership, if you will, uh, by, by this forgiveness option. And if you don't play by the economic benefit rules, you're not gonna benefit by the rules, hence the forgiveness piece. So, you know, this is really why the SBA was originally started in the 50s. It was to create jobs, to create taxes, to create an economic boost. So it's kind of going back to that original purpose of why SBA is even out there. And I think that's why they put it through the SBA and not through some other mechanism. Uh, the Treasury would be a great example, or the, or the IRS would be another example that they could have run this through, and they didn't. They, they chose to run it through SBA. So, um, so keep those concepts in mind as you're working on this program. And, um, and, and kind of going back to the documentation when it comes to forgiveness, keep that in the back of your head because they're going to forgive the things that are going to boost the economy. The things that are going to boost the economy is when individuals can afford to buy the goods that they need to buy because they have jobs, right? And so that's where it's coming back to. Uh, if you want to, oh, just again, remember, you're, you're signing this form. You're signing everything you say is true. If you want to go one more slide, I think there's one more slide, right? Or am I, or is that the last one? No, okay, go back, go back. I have one other comment to say before we go back to uh, the economic injury program. Yep. Um, one of the things about this application is you can only apply one time, guys. So apply for the most. You cannot go back and apply for this again. So if you think, you know what, I only think I need this, this much, go back to the forecasting piece that was spoken about earlier. Understand your true cash flow needs. Understand what you're going to do. The forgiveness is going to be limited to some of the numbers that were spoken about earlier. It's going to be 25% cap in salary decrease. It's going to be 25% cap in headcount, right? Those pieces are going to be there. And then 75% of the money needs to be used for payroll. However, however, um, understand the amounts you really, really need. And if you need to turn some of this into debt, that's okay if you qualify for it, if you make sense, if you do that, if you know that you're doing it proactively. You don't want to have accidental debt that you weren't planning for. So with that, Keith, uh, if you want to go ahead and continue with the uh, economic injury, I think that would be great. Okay. Thank you so much, Jenny. I know a lot of questions have come up and um, we'll try to get through the material first and then perhaps, Jenny, you can look at some of the questions and or We'll get to them as we move through the rest of the presentation. And what we can answer, we promise to get back to you shortly and we'll accumulate them. I'm sure Michael and Bob can get those all to us. Uh, to speak about the EIDL, probably a lot of you are always very familiar with this or you've applied already. Just a reminder about the program. These are the key things. Your eligibility is about what happened to you as a result of this specific disaster. So it has to be related to coronavirus. Your simple rule about economic injury and proving that you're eligible is what was it before, what was it after? And we went through that earlier in the talk. Your credit history, and this all came from training that I was on offered by the SBA, by the way. Your credit history has to be satisfactory to the SBA. A vague term, uh, it typically means something less than bankable, like in the lower 600s could be okay, but certainly still not a lot of the traditional issues that you would have with a bank to try to get a loan, and that would be lots of late payments, bankruptcies, things like that. But the EIDL program has a lot more leeway um, if that's the only factor you have and other factors are strong. You still have to prove you can repay it. 
and this was the exact phrase from the training I was on. SBA must determine that the applicant business has the ability to repay the SBA loan. As I mentioned earlier, there's lots of ways to prove that, whether historically or into the future. And then the collateral requirement you see here, there are none on loans up to 25,000. Above that, borrowers must pledge it, okay? Uh, this is the place to go for the EIDL loan. It's that website. Uh, that has changed, right, Jenny? I mean, it was disastrous loans before, and then it became this, what, Sunday night, I think? Uh, yeah, Sunday at midnight. Right. And one of the, I took one of the calls on, earlier in the uh, presentation, and one of my contacts said this might change again. So if it changes again, we'll certainly let you know, but start there right now. These are the documents you should have available for that shortened form. Your P&L should cover the period, not in your calendar year, but February 1st to January 31st, because they'll ask you about your revenue and your cost of goods sold during that time. And they'll ask you about your banking information for the $10,000 grant. Once your loan is submitted, and again, that's many of you, your follow-up is this disaster customer service at sba.gov, okay? Moving along, here's about filing your application, some insights so far. Why have files been declined? The major reason we know this is because they've been either incomplete, they're lacking signatures throughout, and that can include your tax returns. Every document has to be signed and dated. Just don't even think about it. Everything's signed and dated. Or all the partner Keith, information is not listed. Mm -hmm. Keith, if you, if you want to add, these same reasons for not getting approved here are the same reasons that we're being told by the states around the country for the mm -hmm. state disaster loan programs that are there. So. Might as well just fix this now for everybody. Okay, I will for sure. Okay, and again, this is mainly into the national program that I'm referring to here. So you know, bad credit, still bad credit. 620 seems to be a minimum credit score where deals are getting done. And there are certain common pitfalls by documents um, that I have looked into for the 4506T and all the other ones that are typically being submitted in order to support your application. Okay, what happens after you submit some of you have already probably been contacted by a loan processor. They're checking for eligibility and completeness. You get called for an underwriting call to go over the documents in your application and the, and the materials and the information. If you're approved, a case manager comes along and then the rest of the process takes place all the way to funding. Uh, in the SBA training I was a part of, it was said that disbursement would be in tranches. But again, all of this that we're saying, just like we're saying with PPP, check with your banker, with EIDL, once you're assigned a loan processor or a credit or a case manager, re, uh, reconfirm everything that we're sharing with you today and ask them what the latest update is. And Jenny, what's the current grace period, right? I think it's six months right now, or is it 12 months? It's been changed a couple of the times. Deferment, the deferment, yeah. it's down to six months for all the programs. Okay. It was so up to 12, and as of a few hours ago, everything is six months. Okay, there you go. So another recent change. And really, that's everything we have on the EIDL as well. So um, again, we'll get to your questions um, that you have in the Q&A area as soon as we can. Probably we've taken over a little bit of our allotted time. So in the interest of making sure you get to the rest of the presentations, we'll handle those written. And again, well, we'll get back to you. Here's what I'd like to suggest, Keith. Um, we have a few more minutes uh, for the portion you guys had. You? Okay. And, yeah, and the cleanest way to do it perhaps is that if you and Jenny want to skim through the questions that have come in in the okay. uh, questions bar there and just glance at you know the two or three that you think might be most relevant for what you just discussed then we'll go on to the other portions and then if we have time at the end we'll come back and do some more questions and I'll remind everyone that we'll go through all the questions afterwards in post replies with the uh, materials we're sharing uh, afterwards okay. as well as it'll be you know okay. email to everyone Perfect. So one of the questions that um, was asked, and there's probably uh, two questions that were asked, but I think a lot of you are asking yourselves. Um, I'm an LLC and I don't pay myself. Um, what if I don't have any, any employees? So the, uh, the way that compensation is considered, we have been told, and again, this is just what we've been told, you got to check with your bank, but how they're interpreting it is that distributions are permitted to be part of the compensation because that is how you pay yourself. So therefore distributions are permitted in the total calculation. Um, especially if you're not taking a salary or you're taking maybe like a really, really low salary and then you're doing distributions but you're paying medical expenses out of there. So the medical would count and then the distributions would count as well. So um, that's, that's number one. The other question was about the CBD industry. So 
Um, marijuana, we know, is not permitted, regardless of what state you're in and what the laws are in the state, because it is a federal program. CBD, I'm going to tell you, is probably going to depend on whether or not um, the product, the, the, where the, the base product is. Most likely, it's going to take some time for any lenders to get comfortable with that. So the short answer is going to be probably not. And by the time they figure it out, the money may run out. Um, but it doesn't mean that you shouldn't call your bank because if your bank is very well versed in CBD, they may have a different opinion on it. So those are some of the ones that are kind of subject to interpretation, which is why it's important that you know who your bank is and you have a good relationship with them. Jenny, what about 1099 versus W-2 and other contractors? 1099s are absolutely permitted and they're identified as permitted in the law itself. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, well, those are the main ones. Andy, I just wanted to chime in. I heard by text as recently as a couple minutes ago that a couple of our partner companies have talked to the banks and their banker is willing to review a draft of the form. I don't think most people will because they're going to be overloaded, but can't hurt to ask. So I can tell you what we're doing at First Horizon. Um, we are allowing clients to start the application. We're telling them where to find it. We're not necessarily sending it to them, but we do have like our own document list that we're going to be collecting and most banks do. So there are a lot of banks that are willing to look at it and take a look at it and kind of use it for a test run, if you will, so that they um, are prepared for Friday. Uh, the Friday is a start for most businesses. Keith kind of flew over the fact that um, sole proprietors and contractors don't start until April 10th. That application starts April 10th. And just because the government can accept loan numbers on Friday doesn't mean the banks will be ready to do it because this is happening so fast and we still don't have final guidance. So on the call that I was on earlier, they asked us if we would be willing to work through the night and through the weekend if we needed to. And of course, everyone said yes. And that most of your bankers are going to be willing to do this. Most of us in the banking world recognize the dire need for this funding and are willing to really do whatever we need to do to help our clients. And I, I have not met a banker that does not feel that way. So um, definitely, definitely reach out to your bank, make sure that they understand. If you have a lot of employees, or if you are, you know, God forbid, potentially going out of business, if you don't get this funding, your banker partner needs to know that because they need to do what they need to do to help you. Um. Keith, uh, any other uh, questions that you see up there that you want to answer right now? If not, we'll uh, move on to the next portion. Yeah, let's move on and I'll go answer them in the chat as we move okay. on. So if you want to stop sharing and uh, Mike and Nick, if you could share your screen. All right, there we go. Is it uh, re-up? All right, Nick is Nick is going to start. This is Mike Bergmeier. Nick, you uh, you there? I'm here. I'm here. Mike, you're going to control, so I'll let you flip slides. Okay. Um, okay. So um, today, uh, deals are still getting done. Um, I've heard this from multiple lawyers. We've seen it firsthand. Companies are still getting funded. That being said, Gary's point is exactly right things are taking longer and people are going to have to talk to more people than you expect. <clears throat> um, for, you know, it's, it's also important to think about how you prioritize your time in talking with investors and the relationships that you have you know, developed over a longer time are going to be a more fertile place. Uh, if you're dealing with funds, funds that are earlier and have less investments, um, if, you know, a fund is a lot of, if it's 80 or 90% tapped and, they have a lot of food service investments. They're probably going to be a bit distracted right now, or you know, CPG investments that sell in the food service. So, you know, prioritizing your time on the funds that are going to be the most likely uh, is is what you want to do. Today, what it's not a great time to start a process. This is not when you want to raise your you know large round that's going to give you three years of cash. Getting through a year of cash is much better. Um, and you know, to Gary's point earlier, he was talking about you know, having that kind of daily 
cash you know spreadsheet prioritizing it or you know forecasting it every day you don't necessarily have to replace your investor deck with that but if you you know inform investors that you are that detailed and you you know you've been able to take your million dollar cash need and scale it down to 500 um, because you've recognized that things aren't going to go exactly like you think and you're that organized in your process then you've diffused risk and at the end of the day investors are about risk and return and in times like this they think a little bit more about risk than they do usually. So the more you can diffuse risk, the better off you're going to be. Um, your best investors right now are your current investors. And I would encourage everybody to open and honestly talk with them early on. Uh, remember, they know what's going on. They're feeling it too. You know, the more that you can kind of get on the table now uh, and talk to them about what, you know, what could be the worst case, if things are improving over time, if you know, the things that you've said are going to happen from a cash, cash usage and savings um, and sales standpoint, if those things happen, then you've gained credibility and you've overperformed your initial expectation. Um, they expect that this is going to be a difficult time for sometimes good reasons that you're getting a big acceleration in orders right now and you need to fund it. Um, or, or maybe not. Maybe you have food service that you're selling into and that's, you know, quieted down. Uh, so open, honest, and lots of communication as early as possible and be realistic. Uh, remember, this is a time when people are focused on risk. The more credible you are, the better off you're going to be. Um, you know, one, one thing to think about too is if you're going to raise a round right now and you want to get 12 months of cash, first of all, you want to get the cash as quickly as possible. You want to spend the least amount of money doing it. And one way to do that is with convertible notes. And you can do it with safes as well if, you know, if your investors will permit it. If you do a full round with documents, you know, it's going to cost you 25000 plus and be probably 80 or 100 pages of docs for a new series of preferred. If you do convertible notes, that's you know, anywhere from 15 to maybe 25 pages. And a safe is less than 10. So if you can paper it quickly, you know, provide fair terms, you know, don't try to you know, push the market at this point but try to raise 12 months of cash because getting 12 months of cash diffuses risk. The CARES money, I know we've spent a lot of time on that. You know, go after that very quickly. Um, that's a viable tool. If you have a line of credit, you know, we've already talked about that. You can max that out. That's, that's a good point. And remember when you're talking with investors that you know, milestones still count. All of the things that you've talked about in the past uh, to help you raise money, what you're going to do with it, how, you know, what, it's, what it's going to get you to in a year. You know, that, that's what really makes sense right now is, you know, kind of focusing on all of those things with the thought that you're going to be a lot more focused. You, you might be concentrating on your power SKUs. You might be canceling your promotions and, and promotions right now. I know there was a question out there. You know, it seems like a really good time to, you know, to maybe increase promotions. You know, I think the point has been made to conserve cash and reel those back. And I think that's great. You know, the other point to make, we've actually done a study internally where we compared the 20 largest companies and spins to 20 smaller, better for you ones. And what we found is the price elasticity or the, the reaction to a percentage change in price is four and a half times the bigger ones. So if you're thinking about going to a deeper discount right now, first of all, going to a deeper discount itself isn't going to give you as much as you think. Um, and also, you know, again, this is the time to conserve cash and not spend it. Mike, you want to flip? Um, so where do you go today? Uh, well, first of all, existing investors of, is of course best, but if you're thinking about the different groups of, of investors, you know, family offices and high net worth individuals are going to be the most distracted right now. They were the first to dry up in the last recession, and that's going to happen again here. And it's, it's really because they have the broadest scope of distractions. So they're not, they don't just have a mandate like an institution to invest in CPG companies that are better for you. Uh, you know, and do minority preferred rounds, they've also got real estate investments. They may have multiple businesses themselves. Um, they've got family members and things like that. Uh, all of those complexities in life are distracting them. Um, and uh, they're also, you know, a lot of that money moves to safer assets and a broader portfolio allocation. Uh, some of the money that they had allocated to do, you know, deals like uh, investing in your company might be going to treasuries right now. Institutions, deals are continuing, pace is slower. There's you know, definitely a prioritization of existing companies, but at the same time, you know, the fundamentals of the sector are still very good and they are going to continue through this hiccup. Uh, they did it in the last recession and they will again. People are gonna continue to move 
into, you know, into things that improve vitality. You're already seeing, you know, surges in immunity in certain sectors. A lot of companies I talk to have acceleration in sales 20, 30, 40% more than usual. Um, but at the same time, we have some uncertainty in the near term. Some institutions are looking for bargains. Others are being very aggressive. You know, the best assets right now are getting funded as if nothing's going on around us. <clears throat> um, strategics are still interested, but it's, a, it's much more of a mixed bag. And international strategics in particular are more distracted, particularly Europeans. Um, there's operational issues, there's supply chain issues. Uh, you know, there's plenty of liquidity and access to capital, but there are a lot of district or there's a lot of distractions happening right now that are slowing it down. <clears throat> um, a lot of a lot of big strategics will have a ban on M&A or a ban on new fundings right now, um, and that's kind of a blanket ban. But if you're in an existing conversation and you have two or three or four people like business unit heads that are dialed into you know to doing your deal. You know, it's, it's not a wasted effort to keep pushing those in and get an exception from the ban. We've heard of that happening. Mike, I'll push to you. Okay, thanks. Um, so in talking to your investors, it's just a, it's, a, it's a critical moment. This is all about empathy. It's all about humanity. You can't sell right now. You have to show that you're honest. You understand your business. You understand that everyone is dealing with this. Investors, everyone is working from their home who can right now um so you you just want to you, you don't want to oversell it's incredibly important that that investors kind of see the humanity in you as an entrepreneur as well and this goes to any situation at any day but i think even more today than at any time um you want to know what's working in your business you want to be very clear about that and you want to but you also want to show what you don't know um, it's impossible right now to really plan 2020 with any kind of certainty, but you will know how many doors you're in, what your velocity is, is at, what kind of spike you've seen if you have with, with the recent um, situation, and then you might have a sense of where you're going to go after that. Um, but you want to know all of your numbers. You want to know what kind of uncertainty might be out there, and you're not going to have all the answers for that uncertainty, but just like I think Gary was saying that a plan or Andy was saying that the only thing about a plan is that nothing will ever go to plan, but a plan is something that's a window into how you think. And just more as important here is you want to show investors that you have thought through all of the different issues that your business and the risks that you're facing and you have contingency plans in, in place about that. Um, when you're talking about your company, you know, you want to be numbers based. This is not a time to talk about the best product and the and the, the best this and that. We actually wrote an article a few years ago um, that says for buyers, investors, the numbers rule. And it, it kind of goes through all the numbers that you want to talk about. And we can provide the link to that later. But, you know, how are you? How did you get here? It's about revenue. It's about growth rate, capital efficiency. What's, what's happening with you? What's the pipeline fill versus the run rate? Um, you know, let, let the numbers do the talking for you. Um, you know, with that, and with that, obviously talk about what actions you're taking to reduce costs, to keep cash, to, to make this as safe as possible. Because investors, at the end of the day, when an investor comes into a company, it's all about assuming risk. And you need to show to what extent you can reduce that risk and take that risk away and that you're with them together. So obviously know your plan in detail. Um, the data be so important as it always is. It, you may not have spins, you may not have access to IRI data. Uh, perhaps there are others that can get that for you. Um, but what we've been thinking about and what we're seeing now, we're hearing from some investors is that because I think people are taking that step back and they're looking at the humanity, this is a chance to impress. It's a chance to stand out. It's not to be pushy, but it's a chance to explain your business, what you're doing, how your product is, is performing and, and what can work. Um, one thing we've also uh, been thinking about is almost like there's going to be the, for a lot of companies, there's going to be a COVID bump when you look back at the financial uh, kind of a year from now, two years from now. The question is, what can you do to make some of those bumps stick? And so you want to show again your thinking about what you're doing um, you know, with that. One important thing is if you can get the data, and it could be anecdotal, it could be as simple as kind of going to um, 
if you go to a store, you know, no one wants to be that one product that's still on the shelf right now in, in your category. You'll find out how you're doing versus the others. Any chance you can to have any kind of data or story that you're outperforming the category right now that you are a go-to product um, is, is important. And highlight the sell-through success prior to March. We've got a client right now that just had a remarkable January and February and then saw the bump again in March. But you know, you've got those months uh, that were already there that can help you tell your story. And I know uh, we're, we're running out of time here on the, on the equity side here. What we've done in the past, we've always kind of talked about different drivers of value, and we broke them into several dimensions. We've got, just got three slides here I can go through very quickly. Financial dimensions, the product and brand, and sales related. And what we really wanted to think about and explain today or just talk about is like when investors are really looking at a business, what are the ones that would be the most important to highlight to investors right now? Gross margins are always important. There's no better way to minimize the amount of money that you need to keep more of the ownership for your, make your company more attractive than to high, have a high gross margin. So if you can cut that trade spend, you can push the products that high, have higher margin, that is incredibly important. So you wanna talk about that. Capital efficiency, this is how much money have you spent versus how much revenue you've gotten. Think about your business in, in phases, in phase one, phase two, phase three. You know, think about and then be able to show during these different phases, and especially now or the last couple of months and what you're doing now, how much revenue you can, you can bring in with the cuts you've made, with the ration, rations that you've made, that you can become and you are becoming a much more capital efficient business. To Nick's point about having 12 months of cash, you're going to show how you can do much more with that money. On the product and brand attributes, you know, a lot of times companies have a, have a broad portfolio of products. The ones that are going to matter the most are the ones with the higher, highest velocity. Push those. If you get down to that question, like Gary and Andy were talking about earlier, running your um, your, your co-packers and you build need to build inventory, only choose the ones that sell through quickly. Uh, we actually saw another company too, interestingly enough, though, to that has some older inventory of some products that weren't selling. And this was an opportunity for them to sell through that excess inventory. And that's cash that has already been spent to build it. And, you know, so, but really thinking about your product portfolio and what you have and what you can sell, what you can focus on now, anything that is as high velocity as possible is the most important. And then on the key sales data, velocity again, and, and see if there is any way where you can find out that you're exceeding the category and have that anecdote out there and then distribution. This is something that we've been seeing about and hearing about is the change, the change in the retail landscape. And that's only being accelerated right now, the move to online, the move to multiple channels. Um, you know, online, show that you can sell your, yourself through Shopify, Amazon, Thrive, other, other online marketplaces, um, Club is other. But the more you can show that you are prepared and you succeed in this multiple channel universe, the better. And that's, that's what we've got here uh, on the equity side. But deals are getting done and, uh, and, and keep going. And, you know, find a lead, like find your Gary Hirschberg can make calls for you. You know, maybe that's one of your existing investors as well. You know, but if, if people can vouch for you and talk for you, that, that goes a long way. Okay, well, thanks, Mike and Nick. Um, Mike, if you want to stop sharing, uh, we'll welcome Elliot up next. Okay, I'll try. <laughs> uh, I'm trying unsuccessfully. You should see something that says stop sharing, either at the top or bottom. No. Uh, click on share, uh, my, uh, Nick. Oh, and sorry, yeah, I see yeah. the red, yeah, okay. there we go. Perfect, thanks. Mike. <laughs> okay, Elliot. All right, hang on one second while my computer thinks here. <clears throat> nice. All right, and nothing like bringing up the rear. So no, no new thinking to go through here, but we'll uh, try to, to add a little bit of uh, contrarian thought. Um, so I wanna talk about one of the things that both uh, Nick and Mike and, and everyone thus far has emphasized, and that's the importance right now of capital efficiency. 
I mean, this is an ingredient that's always important in your business, but now more so than ever. And it's not just about surviving this period of time, it's surviving to thrive. I mean, the goal should not be to shelter in place in terms of your business. It should be to take small iterative steps that when the veil is lifted, you have, you have been able to leapfrog your competition. And focusing on some of these elements now will position you to be able to do that going forward. And then, you know, uh, I'll talk a little bit about the uncertainty premium in the marketplace. So, so the number one focus right now should be having a relentless pursuit of capital efficiency. This is not the time to grow for the sake of growth. Um, there are those of you, some of you on this call who are, are seeing some really, really um, uh, huge upswings in, in demand. And that is to other people's point, a voracious consumer of cash. Um, so it, it's important to be mindful of where you are most capital efficient. And it's simple. I mean, it's a simple lesson for everybody. The more efficient you are with the use of your capital, the less of it you need. And the less of it you need, that means more dilution, fewer cooks in the kitchen, and more spent, more time spent on growing your, your brand than on raising uh, money. So uh, another point that's been made by, by multiple presenters today is the importance of, of understanding and monitoring your cash and your cash flow, but also looking for what channels, what ways, what means uh, offer the shortest cash conversion. I mean, that's the key. So the quicker you can turn your inventory into cash, the better you are uh, positioned and the less cash that you need. Um, you know, this is another thing we're talking about and, and I've had lots of people ask, you know, questions around uh, talent and people, and this is probably something made for a, uh, a separate uh, webinar, but, but it, it's important to have a lean and agile team. Um, so while uh, you want to try to be as, as nimble and, and have as small a mouth to feed, um, and given this time and this moment, this is why you want to not have a huge uh, organism that needs a, a lot of food, uh, because there are times when that food isn't abundant, and, and that's where we're in right now. But I'm going to be a little bit contrarian to my own uh, topic here and just say, but at the same time, um, there's huge opportunity here. And that's one of the messages I want to leave with everybody going through this is that, that as entrepreneurs, one of our jobs is to find opportunities amidst the chaos. And there is opportunity as, as companies make changes, difficult decisions, there's talent that's coming available. And, and there may be uh, uh, an opportunity to take some risk in order, uh, in order to take a big step forward. But the key long-term is to build a lean and agile organization where everybody is adding value and doing what needs to be done to drive the business forward. Um, you know, a laser focus on, on unit and channel economics. So uh, gross margin we talk about, we've talked about a bunch and as have uh, trade spend. In my opinion, uh, now is not the time, and I think many share this, to be spending a lot of your promotional dollars. You should be pulling back uh, as much as possible, but also recognizing that certain channels offer different channel economics and offer you an opportunity to uh, grow your sales or maintain your sales with less outflow. Uh, and, and there are other channels right now that are closed off to you that will open up like corporate campuses, colleges and universities, airports, et cetera. But e-commerce, if you're not e-commerce enabled or if that's been on the back burner for you, uh, you need to start thinking about that seriously. It's, it, this has been a seed change. Um, I think according to uh, Bricks Meets Click, 6.3% of grocery was sold online in, in 2019. They were expecting somewhere in the neighborhood of that to be 7%. I've not seen any numbers, but I'm pretty certain we're well, well above that. And even as things uh, normalize, uh, I don't see that retreating back down to the single digits. So if you're not e-commerce enabled, or if this is a secondary strategy for you, think, think, think differently about it and start leaning into the opportunity. And that also in includes really looking at, at how you build future products and what you do to maximize that opportunity. And uh, I think the other thing is, is 
right now, so there's a lot of talk and I've been asked a lot of questions about marketing and about reaching out to, to your consumer. And I heard, uh, I think it was Mike who mentioned one of my favorite words, which was empathy. Um, this is the moment for empathy. This is not the moment for promotion. And again, this is opinion, but this is the time to recognize that we're all going through this. We're all experiencing this in, in our own way and in, in a similar way. And so using your platform, your brand to speak in an authentic way about what, what others are experiencing uh, and, and just keeping top of mind awareness and showing uh, that you are recognizing that is a very effective way to build your tribe digitally right now. So you don't have to be talking about products or benefits or attributes, uh, but just using empathy to build awareness and to build your tribe. Uh, let's talk just, you know, in terms of retail um, in general. So I, I was going to use this a little bit more uh, around capital efficiency, but but so much of this conversation has been about that, that it feels uh, somewhat uh, repetitive if I do. But, you know, retail is obviously the largest and still and will be the largest uh, um, channel for most, most brands. Uh, but you have to take a more curated and disciplined approach to retail going forward. Uh, you need to really understand where your products are going to meet your consumer. Most of you have started products and, and brands because you're solving a problem or meeting an unmet need. So your job is to get your product closer and, and uh, to that unmet need or to where that problem is most pronounced. And not every retailer offers you that option and not every retailer offers you the opportunity to tell your story. And retail is a very, very expensive place to drive discovery and trial. It's a great place to drive replenishment, but but not discovery and trial. So have a curated disciplined approach. Dis determine where you have to be merchandised, what tools you have to have accessibility to, what uh, consumers you want in those stores. And if those criteria aren't met, don't go there because getting on shelf does nothing for you in the, in the long term. It may feel good, uh, but in the long term, it's all about getting off the shelf and into the cart. And then alternative channels. So, so, you know, right now, many of these uh, aren't available, but they will become. And this is a great place to drive discovery. Uh, you know, corporate campuses, colleges and universities, travel, airport, uh, the places, again, where the problem is most pronounced and the need that you're solving most acute, uh, it, it just, you're going to find far more traction. You're going to be, you're going to be found more readily and you're going to spend a lot less money trying to uh, fight for share of attention. So really encourage brands who are trying to be more capital efficient to build their discovery platforms through both e-commerce and alternative channels. Um, but I'll spend the last little bit of time since the first part was somewhat repetitive on what if you still need to raise? Okay, so you, you're, you're doing everything. You're as capital efficient. You've been using uh, Gary's uh, form every day, uh, following all of Andy's advice, but, but at the end, of, you know, you've, you've exhausted all of your other alternatives. What if you still need to raise some money right now? Well, I mean, I, you know, Nick and, and Mike mentioned 12, 12 months. I think that's ideal, but at least six to nine months. What do you need to get by the next six to nine months using your cash flow? what needs to be done, what can you call, what can you shrink, what can you pull back from? And at the end of that, what do you need to survive for the next six to nine months? Exhaust all your other funding options. So all the debt, alternative financing uh, options, CARES, whatever you can do. And then recognize this, there's an uncertainty premium in the market. So you're asking investors, especially if you're a smaller brand seeking angels and especially unsophisticated CPG angels. This could be your friends and family round. This could be just other uh, high net worth individuals who maybe don't have the experience or the expertise in this particular sector. And you're asking them to, to put money in in a time when there is more uncertainty than there has been in the past. 
you have to recognize that that there's a premium there if you're going to want to close around quickly so you've narrowed down your round to as little money as you possibly need to get through the next six to nine months you've leveraged all your other options you recognize the uncertainty premium so what do you do then um, i'm using a little dark humor but i'm calling it an apocalypse round so you raise an <laughs> apocalypse round it's it's a you know it's a convertible note or a safe with with uh you know, terms that are going to excite the anxious investor, the anxious, the anxious angel. And that could be, you know, reducing your value cap, increasing your discount. It could be follow on rights. You, you need to be creative and you need to have that conversation with that investor openly, in my opinion. Um, your job, again, and the whole point that I'm trying to make today is you need to survive to thrive. There's opportunity here. Uh, there's a lot of opportunity to leapfrog your competition. But if you don't take the necessary steps to, you know, really trim anything that is is discretionary, and and if you don't recognize that there is a premium to uncertainty, um, you are not going to raise the money you need to bridge the gap. So with that, Bob, I kind of turn it over to you. Thank you. Thanks, Elliot. If you'd like to uh, stop sharing, perfect. And I'll just throw up uh, this here. Let's see. Sorry about that. So um, we've almost at the end of our time here. And as I mentioned earlier, whoops. Sorry, I'm having a little, there we go having a little um, issue, but I wanted to say that we have everybody's contact information here. Um, we're all gonna be going through the questions afterwards. And a lot of them that have come in have been fairly technical in terms of um, issues around PPP and EIDL, in which case we're gonna be relying on Keith and Jenny to providing a lot of specific answers there. Um, one question I noticed that came up recently uh, that I'll open it up to anyone who wishes to answer is about e-com, meaning um, most people are doing something with Amazon, but otherwise, who might be some of the other key e-com partners out there that people should be looking at? I mean, obviously, there's Thrive Market. Um, a lot of retailers have their own uh, e-com platforms, but Elliot? Yeah, I mean, and Thrive, you know, what the last we've heard isn't, isn't, um, they're, they're just hunkering down a bit. Uh, obviously, Walmart.com um, and then your own, uh, you know, uh, is important. So have, having 3PL capability of your own and having the Shopify or, or WooCommerce site that, that's uh, uh, enabled for e commerce is important. So platform wise, though, I mean, let's be honest, Amazon uh, certainly, uh, is the 800 pound gorilla. And I might've missed this earlier uh, from Jenny and Keith, but a number of people have asked about earlier, early-ish staged companies where the founders aren't taking salaries right now, or they've been deferring salaries, how that um, calculates into the PPP program, or are they eligible for anything? Jenny? Jenny, you're muted. Sorry, if they have not, yeah, I was on, I have two different devices, sorry about that. Um, if they've not taken any salaries at all, then they're gonna be better off applying for the economic injury than they are the PPP. Okay. PPP is really where you can prove salaries have been taken, less of a projection versus the economic injury. You can actually show projections where um, and, and we validated this with SBA. You can actually show this was the track you were going on and this is what you were doing personally to support the business for it. And that might be where the actual economic injury is taken. And therefore, you would apply there for that kind of a thing. And Jenny, uh, yeah, one of ahead. the questions that many people are asking is um, personal guarantees um, on the economic injury where there's not a personal guarantee on the... PPP, can you talk to that and what the threshold cutoff is for personal guarantees? I know it's a moving target. Yeah. Yeah. So what we know today, the economic injury is based on the SBA 
eight aid program. That's the disaster statute uh, in in uh, the not in the federal registry. And so in that statute, they do require personal guarantees. Um, however, there's some nuances that have been made to that. So I would say um, right now, as it stands today, they are asking for personal financial statements and personal guarantees on the economic injury program. However, the application itself doesn't say that, so to speak. When you actually go through the online application, which I've done, it doesn't really delve much into it. It says that someone will contact you with whatever information they're going to need in order to determine the next step. And so I think that it's probably being looked at because they realize that some people are going towards the PBT because that does not have a personal guarantee requirement. Um, the $10,000 loan fund, and I don't know if we talked about that, is part of the economic injury program, and that does not require a guarantee. It's literally a grant. Um, so if you fill out that application and you qualify whether or not you get approved for the loan, you are eligible for this grant. And that is, that's one of the things that went up on Sunday night. So a lot of people don't know about that particular piece of it. Uh, so if you want only the $10,000 grant, there's no personal guarantee. If you want the economic injury the way it was originally rolled out, which is up to $2 million at 3.75 up to 30 years, there's a personal guarantee to that unless you're a not-for-profit. And then the payroll protection does not have a personal guarantee at all. Um, another specific question that came up maybe for Jenny uh, is how furloughed employees are considered for the PPP? The requirement in the program is that they get rehired by June 30th. That is the case today. One of the interesting pieces about this program that kind of the chatter in the banking world is A, a lot of the banks are saying what happens if the money runs out? The Treasury is saying that would be a great problem when we need to get more money. The interesting piece to that, so that's kind of the chatter, the fact is that version one of the application had an expiration date for the application of June 30th, which is consistent with what the bill said the deadline was. Mm -hmm. Version three has an expiration date of September 30th. So at the moment, where we stand today, the anticipation is anyone furloughed, if you bring them back by June 30th, then they will qualify for the forgiveness component. And it Jenny, is possible that if the situation expands, that they may push that date back. Yeah, and Jenny, isn't it you have to bring them back at at least 75% of the prior salary? And 75% of the headcount, both. Mm -hmm. So given, uh, given the information that Andy shared, this might be self-evident, but a number of people have asked whether venture-backed companies are eligible for these programs as well. They are, and that goes back to the operating agreement conversation I started off with earlier. Really mm -hmm. need to have a really solid bylaw of their operating agreement that says who has the right on behalf of this business to take on debt. And at the moment, even though it's the intention is loan forgiveness, it's still debt until it's forgiven. Got it. So at this point, um, in skimming through the questions, most of them look uh, fairly technical uh, that, again, Keith and Jenny will probably be able to answer the majority of them. All this information is going to be posted. Um, Michael, uh, who's been supporting us and helping us with Naturally Bay Area, is going to be sending out links to everyone with um, how to access all this content from Gary's uh, spreadsheet to the deck to uh, answers to the questions. But in our remaining few minutes, I would invite any of the uh, panelists, if they have any final comments, to just uh, offer them up and we'll uh, wrap this up. Andy, you unmuted. Yeah, I had one, which is, um, there was a number of sets of discussion around data um, and how do you know how you're doing? How do you show traction, especially in this weird environment? Remember that for anybody buying spins data, the next period, essentially the month of March comes live on 4-6, which is Monday. And that doesn't give you weekly data, but for people that have Target portals, certainly Amazon data, uh, other portals, you'll have weekly data um, and you can sort of see what happened and talk to people about 
how much your underlying business was growing versus you know this uh, spike if you had a spike or decline if you had a decline. Um, we've got businesses that were up 50% prior to this and then layered on a spike and you want to just head off of the past that the only reason you're doing well is because of this thing or the only reason you're in trouble is because of this thing. The underlying businesses were healthy before. So that was a thought. I'd, ask, I'd add one thing too, just about online. Lots of talk about direct to consumer and online sales. One thing that we've been encouraging some of our clients, especially those that are doing or have done extremely well on direct to consumer is really to the extent that they can get their data and see who is new coming into uh, their franchise. Um, that is good information and great information to share with investors and others about your business, the percent of customers that are new, percent of sales that are new. And if you have contact information for those new consumers, treat, treat them well. They may have been buying your product at retail before, or they might be totally new to the franchise. And, and that is a way to really build a business and, and, and can be really powerful information in, in, a, in a tool here. That's great. Yeah, I'll, just, I'll just quickly yeah. echo uh, skew rationalization. <laughs> it's, uh, there's never a bad time for it, and now is an excellent time for it. It's a really good time to get your efficiencies up, get your long runs up, build trial. Uh, remember that 80-20 rule. And uh, I'll, I'm gonna sign off, but just to remind folks, we do have this, um, these amazing speakers who kind of been through hard times, this Tales for the Trenches uh, series that uh, every Tuesday and Thursday for the month at 5 p.m. Eastern, you can find out about it at the um, Hirschberg Entrepreneurship Institute. And uh, uh, it's been a pleasure joining you all. Thank you. Thanks, Gary. Hey, and before we, uh, um, before we finish- can I, can I read you with one thing? Oh, sure. Sorry. Yeah. yeah, sorry. Just in terms of closing, you know, one of the things that's really amazing about this particular presentation is that you've brought to the audience all the different elements of it. And I just want to emphasize the importance of that, that um, there's a lot of questions about a lot of different things and businesses right now are really experiencing why banks say be diverse, manage cash have cash. This is exactly it. This is what they're talking about. This is the environment that they're trying to protect you and their banks against. And what you're sharing here is what the banks want to see the businesses doing. So I really want to emphasize that to the viewers. This is exactly what everyone should be thinking about. Excellent. Thank you, Jenny. And uh, Dawn, your firm, uh, Davis Wright Tremaine, has been sending out a really good uh, sort of email newsletter um, referring to, you know, sort of the uh, financing environment and funding in general and things about operating efficiently. Do you want to uh, share how people can get on that list? You're on mute right now, Don. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Uh, thanks, Bob. So uh, we can send out an uh, email link to everybody on this call um, who wants to participate in, and please, please uh, send it to anyone who you think might be interested. It's a weekly newsletter and we're trying to stay very current on information that's available in this sector. And, and likewise, Elliot, um, how can folks get on your list as far as your, uh, your newsletter, blog, et cetera? Yeah, thanks, Bob. Uh, just, I'll do the same. I'll make sure to connect, have the link in, in uh, what we send out, but it's just uh, tigbrands.com and you can subscribe right there. Perfect. And uh, Keith and uh, Nick, any final words? I'll just go quickly. If I can be helpful to anyone on these applications as they're looking at either EIDL or PPP, you can reach out to me at the email provided and uh, I can help review your applications and your supporting documents. So please consider me a resource for that. Yeah, and I think I, I guess one closing thing, just, you know, th this is a great time to, to really know the details of your business. And the more you understand, you know, to Gary's point, if you know your, your daily cash burn, if you can very quickly answer the question of, you know, what is your monthly burn, adding payroll, rent, you know, all those things, just knowing that detail in your business, you're going to have more credibility and you're going to de-risk, you know, any investor situation that you're in. And that's your data too. And, and Bob, if I could just 
dovetail on that. I mean, I think now, if I could just encourage everyone, now is the time to take action. I mean, it's really easy to throw up your hands and, and, and retreat or just dismiss that people are going to be too busy and not doing things. Uh, but there's a lot of action that you can take to to make your business a better business when you when we come out to whatever the whatever the new uh, homeostasis is, and that's everything from your team to your branding to your channel strategy to your financing, and you know the the companies that take the steps, and even if they're small imperfect steps right now, and use this time wisely and smartly, are going to be the ones that are better prepared and in better position to succeed going forward. Yeah, absolutely agree. And it may sound trite, but keeping one eye uh, on the present and the here and now and dealing with everything we're going through and one eye on the future where we can start to imagine what life is gonna be like after we get through this, it most assuredly won't be uh, going back to be 100% the same as uh, the way things were before, but the more we can anticipate where those opportunities are and what business is going to be like is going to be very helpful. And um, sort of the final thing I'd want to say is just, you know, this all came together very quickly, this uh, session we pulled together here. Um, some of the background for those of you who may know is that uh, Mike, Nick, Andy, and I, and Keith, do a uh, financing workshop that's a full day long. We do it twice a year. We've been doing it for 13 or 14 years, along with the uh, sales seminar I do with my friend, John Majuri. And uh, Dawn had actually reached out and said, hey, I know you guys are planning to do this sometime in maybe July. And in fact, uh, he was gonna be hosting us again in San Francisco and said, you know, there's such an acute need for this now. Is there a way to put some of the most relevant information up there uh, as quickly as possible? And so, with uh, his help and his team, uh, people like Michael and Vanessa from Naturally Bay Area, and the panelists here, we were able to uh, come, you know, go live today. So uh, we had a few bumbles and stumbles, but otherwise, uh, there'll be a lot of good content to access after the fact. It's been recorded. The decks will be available. The links will be available, and hopefully, uh, you'll find this helpful. And I think. Um, Everyone has essentially welcomed you to reach out with uh, specific questions. Everyone's email is uh, up there as well. So uh, thanks again for being part of this and uh, thanks to our panelists.